okay, having played computer shuffle. Um, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I always love coming to NDF. I've been a number of times now and it's such a great conference. So I re always really enjoy it. So anyway, let's dive in. Um, so today um, we're going to be talking about linking, um, telling stories and facil facilitating research by using our very rich resources in the best way possible. Um, and this seems to be a really emerging theme for me in this conference. Um, many other talks have been talking about linking. Many people and organisations seem to be looking and considering, at this, considering this at the moment. So we've all got collections um, and we spend a good deal of our professional lives carefully documenting them, uh, housing them, studying them, writing about them, exhibiting them. Um, and more recently, well, sort of if you're thinking in museum, time, digitising and databasing them. And now um, we're all very enthusiastically putting them online. And by putting our collections online, we hope to achieve something like this. So this slide is from a recent talk that was given by Gavin, Mall Gavin Mallory at MCN in New Orleans just a few weeks ago. And it's definitely worth going back and having a watch of it because it's really a great talk. And he starts with the question, what's the point of a museum collection online? And then he goes to some deep, dark places and ends up with a kind of every museum everywhere mission statement. And that's what this is. So for him, the every museum everywhere mission is to deliver, museums deliver their collection to educate and inspire people about the world. So he encourages the audience to amplify their museum's mission with inspiring and educational online collections. And so we do that. We put our collections online with great, with great enthusiasm, and we've all got them. And they're everywhere if you go looking. If you do a search for museum online collections, which admittedly not very many people would do, um, you'll get a whole bunch of museum online collections. And they're all sitting in their own kind of little museum-y bubble. Um, but we've got plenty in common. You can think of any topic you like and you'll get, you'll get results to a search on any of these museum collections. So I like bicycles, for example. And a search in a few random places, a uh, few random collections kind of makes my point. So at Te Papa, I found a silly bicycle. At Museum Victoria, I found a winning bicycle. Uh, over at the Met, I found a bicycle as art. Well, most of a bicycle as art. And at the British Museum, I found a toy bike. And actually, you know, I've picked out a few examples, but I could have found silly bikes. I could have shown you just silly bikes from all of those collections, or winning bikes from all of those collections. Um, we've all got lots of very similar stuff. So if I'm doing research on bicycles, and I happen to know to go looking in museum collections, and that's a big if. Um, then I can find lots and lots of stuff that might be relevant to the research that I'm doing. Um, and maybe that's how I like to do my research. Maybe I like to just go and visit, visit sites, do some Google searches, pick out, pick out a bunch of stuff, make the connections myself. But maybe I also, maybe it would really help me out because I'm trying to do some research um, to to actually get some assistance and to, to get, when I get to one, to one place, where's the next point that I might consider going? So help comes in various forms. Um, there are, of course, aggregators like the Google Cultural Institute or the Google Art and Cult with the Google Arts and Culture website, where you can get results from many different organisations and where particularly keen users can do things like make their own collection, um, or in the, which is in the Google Arts and Culture website is called their own gallery. Similarly, Digital NZ, closer to home. Um, again, searching for bicycles gives me lots and lots of results. And I can use the sets feature, again, to make my own, own collections. And the sets feature is um, currently being improved um, and will soon come out, uh, or is in the beta version of Digital NZ as the stories feature. Um, so uh, that's, that's certainly one way that you can do it. But that's still limited to those particular aggregation sites. 
Ultimately, all of these bicycles that I've found are kind of a bit random and they just sort of reflect what I've been able to find a bit randomly on different collection sites. And this randomness might suit a small group of people, but I'm really not, not convinced that it suits everybody. Some research that we've done on our museum's website um, shows that 78% of visitors to our, to our museum's website identify themselves as knowledge seekers. So that is people who are there doing research in a topic that they have a personal interest in, sometimes have a professional interest in, but often it's a personal, it's a personal research for a personal hobby or interest. Um, and that includes about 20% of people who are there uh, for educational reasons at all levels, from primary school right through to, uh, to university. So they're not there just to kind of do random stuff. They're there to find an answer to a question or to seek information about a topic that they're interested in. So what can we do to help those people? Can we, can we provide them with the next steps on their journey so that they spend more time finding information that is useful to them and less time getting distracted by some of the seriously weird things that you can find in your collection <laughs> if you happen to go looking? I'll just leave that, that image with you just for a second there. <laughs> so you can really enjoy it. I was going to look for a cat picture, but then I found that and thought, oh no, I've got to use that one instead. So this very mysterious looking slide is from a, uh, a talk given recently at our museum by um, an academic and archivist called Mike Jones. And he's, you can kind of, it might be a bit too bright on the stage, but you can kind of see him lurking in the shadows there. So in his talk, he was uh, quoting an academic called Ian Hodder, um, who's interested in, in thingness. Um, and he was asking the questions about, also asking the questions about whether we can give users stepping stones, either around our own collection or between collections, give them some help. And so this academic um, is writing about thingness and connect connectedness. And as he says, things assemble. We've seen that things are not isolated. It's in their connections and in their flows into other forms that their thingness resides. And Mike, who I've had, many, had the chance to have many good conversations with, um, in his own work challenges, challenges me often to, to think about this connectedness as well. And challenges us to say, okay, so it's all very well to have all these things in our collection, but Every time you just have a thing in your collection and it's not connected anywhere, you're not giving the next person any sort of help. So everybody has to start their research from the same point. Is there a way that we can provide somebody with a, a trace of what we've already found so that they can start with the next step rather than um, just having to go back to the first, first point again? So there are some programmatic attempts at doing all this connecting. And we've probably all sat in conference talks and heard about linked open data. And I could start to draw you some entity relationship diagrams and talk about RDF. And that would, of course, all end up with saying that the results of all this effort is a sparkle endpoint. Um, but if you want a really impressive talk about uh, linked open data, I'm afraid I'm not going to be the one to give it to you. But I would suggest when the video comes out to go back and have a look at Adam Moriarty's talk from yesterday, because that was one of the best linked open data talks that I've ever heard. And he's sitting down there in the front, so well done, Adam. <laughs> um, this slide full of, full of guff is uh, a linked open data um, representation of Museum Victoria's collections, which was made by... Um, a, a, a gun programmer called Connell Tuey. Instead of uh, talking to you about uh, linked open data, I'm going to refer you again to another one of the MCN Ignite talks, this time by David Newbury. In that talk, um, so David Newbury is a programmer, and in that talk he says, linked open data is confusing, it's difficult, and it's advocated by shaggy developers, of which he says he's proudly one. Now, Adam's not very shaggy, so I'm not sure about the shaggy developer bit. But he goes on to show a sentence, which is, you know, something that many people would not have any clue about. And he says, he, he knows that he's one of those shaggy developers because not only can he understand this sentence and write it, but he's actually tried to do it. That bug really is annoying, isn't it? And it's very big. Oh, now it's on the microphone. Good. 
Um, so what, he goes on, what David Newbury goes on to say is that people care about people, and museum people are not normal people. Normal, keep, pe normal people care about themselves, and normal people want to know how the things in their museum relate to the things in their life. And I'll add, and, and that I'll add that they're interested in finding out the th not only the things that relate to their lives, but the things that they're particularly interested in. And again, Richard Foy gave us a very, um, gave us the perfect example of his, in his talk yesterday about finding the image of his grandmother in an archival photograph. So we need to talk about the link part rather than the data part. The other thing you notice in museum collections online is that just searching in the museum collections locks you into a kind of museum-y sort of bubble. It's definitely cool stuff, but what about the cool stuff in libraries? What about the cool stuff in the archives and in the newspaper, the digitised newspapers? So if I'm actually doing a research about a topic that I'm interested in, that I don't want to find a bunch of random things. I want things that connect together. And the sources for the story I'm looking to tell might be all over the place. So instead, what I'd like to talk to you now about, and for the rest of the talk, is the networked artefact. The artefact that's bolstered by the story that can be told if you go looking in all sorts of other places. And this quote is from a piece that was published recently in Medium um, by a guy called William Owen, who writes under the, um, under the tag of Made by Many. And the article title is The Open Source Museum. Again, very worth going and having a look at. Um, and so what he says is that we really should be able to take take and link things. The 21st century museum needs no longer to be a locked cabinet or a discrete physical space marked by a singular collection policy. So I'll also use an example from the Cooper Hewitt. Um, uh, so they tried to do some of this linking uh, using something that, a term that they called concordances, and they tried to uh, make pro programmatic links by person. Um, that's also the, op the approach that many linked open data projects have taken because people, people and relationships are easy to build. Um, so worth going and having a look at what, they, what the Cooper Hewitt managed to do. Closer to home at Museum Victoria, we're also trying to turn our objects into networked artefacts. And at the moment, what we're trying to do is a bit more clunky. It's not as cool. We're just trying to bring objects to life um, by including links to the research that we've been doing into our collections online so that other people might also be able to follow that research. We've been working particularly with specimens. Um, we've got many specimens in our collections and something like this animal is just a snake in a jar until you start having a look at what the uh, story behind it is. This specimen turns out to be particularly interesting because uh, it's the very first taipan that was milked for its venom. And it's got um, a, a, a sad tale that belongs to it, which is that the uh, guy who caught it originally um, uh, was actually bitten by the snake as he caught it, uh, and he, di he subsequently died. Um, but the snake was transported alive down to, from Cairns down to Melbourne, uh, was milked, and the very first antivenine was created from that, uh, that snake. Um, and so it, it died subsequently a few weeks uh, later in Melbourne Zoo and was given to the museum. So we've been able to find that story by looking in our version of Papers Past, uh, the digitised newspapers in Trove, um, and we have other parts of our collection which also tell the story uh, coming from the Commonwealth Serum, Serum Laboratories. And so that's a pretty cool story. That links up bits of our collection and tells us more about one of the specimens. Um, and, and it's also, something that's interesting is that it's, is, this is relatively new in sciences, but is totally the bread and butter of humanities research. So in addition to finding out interesting historical uh, um, stories, there's very good reasons for scientists uh, to want to link things up. In 1858, uh, our first director, Frederick McCoy, uh, was the first, he was the first director of the National Museum of Victoria, and he started on a project to publish a, um, a, a book called the Prodromus, which means first descriptions, um, of every uh, animal known in Victoria. And he engaged some of the best artists in the colony to do drawings of these animals that he was going to put in his book. And our museum collection is very, um, is, has, has this fantastic trove of, of those illustrations, going from original sketches, um, 
more detailed sketches of um, part, specific parts of the animals through to handwritten notes. And finally, to the final uh, lithographic plates. But what we also have is um, the original specimens. Now, granted, this one's not looking too great, <laughs> but we've still got him. And he turns out to be very interesting because he was the, this specimen, this possum specimen, is, is this specimen that was figured in those plates that I just showed you quickly, and you'll get, to, you'll get an opportunity to see them again. Um, he, was the very first, he was the one that was depicted in the very first description of the Leadbeater's possum, which appeared in the Annals and Magazines of Natural History in 1867. This is the sketch from, uh, from which that plate in the Annals and Magazine uh, was um, originally uh, just made. And here it is. Um, here's the sketch as it finally appeared in the publication. You can see, if I just go back, he was a bit droopy to start with. And now he's looking quite jaunty. So there was a little bit of artistic license that went on. I particularly like the little waving hand, the little jazz hand that he's got. Um, now, the, where I'm showing you this, the, the website that um, uh, this plate can be found is the Biodiversity Heritage Library website. And Siobhan Leachman talked about the, a bit about the Biodiversity Heritage Library yesterday. And I'll talk a bit more about it as well. But suffice to say for the moment, it's a... Uh, project, a worldwide project, to digitise and make freely accessible and available um, biological material. Here also is the first description, the text of the first description, um, in a different page of the Annals and Magazine. So 20 years later, McCoy included a reworked drawing of this same specimen in his prodromus. By the time it went into the prodromus, though, it looked a bit different. It's still got, it hasn't quite got the same jazz hands, which is a bit sad. Um, uh, and it's, it's reversed because now it's a lithographic print. Um, so in, in that printing production, um, he's now facing the other way. And this pa publication has also been fully digitised and is in, in, as in the, is in the Biodiversity Heritage Library. So we can link straight from our collection site out to the Biodiversity Heritage Library. So this little animal changed quite a bit in, its, in how it was drawn uh, but in the 20 years between the first description and being published in the Annals and Magazines of Natural, uh, in the um, Prodromus. So that might not be very much, of very much interest, maybe, to scientists, but it might be of great interest to scientific artwork historians. And so this is one example where linking, even between things in our own collection, is worthwhile. And for museums like ours that have got both sciences and humanities collections, linking the different disciplines gives you really rich opportunities for more interest. In the case of this specimen, we'll just go off on a little specimen tangent for a moment. And that very last link is there to the online zoological collections of Australian museums, which is Australia's data aggregator. So the linking to literature is a very rich um, way of providing more information. Um, Linking out to the online zoological collections of Australian museums, or OSCAM, is a way for scientists to really investigate, visualise and um, look at the data. But I'm not going to go very... That's all you're going to see of OSCAM today. You can do mapping and you can do all sorts of things uh, if you're interested in the specimen data. Why I'm mentioning it is because we have another data aggregator of which OSCAM is a part, the specimen-based part, and that's called the Atlas of Living Australia. If we go to the species page for the Leadbeater's possum, we can see that that very same illustration, uh, we can see the very same illustration that we've been looking at. And here it is. So to tell the next piece of the story, let's have a change of animal. Here's another animal featured in McCoy's prodromus, which is the very fancy tasseled anglerfish. Again, we have the original illustrations in the collections, and here it is in the Biodiversity Heritage Library. As Siobhan mentioned yesterday, we take those, um, take those illustrations and we put them into Flickr albums. Um, we, really, we do this, because, again, to make it findable for the people who are looking. So people who are interested in images and artwork might well go looking in Flickr. They may well never find something like a digitised library. Once it's in Flickr, we've got a link back to the Biodiversity Heritage Library. And then we start tagging them 
And again, Siobhan talked about this yesterday. And most importantly, we machine tag them. Now, machine tagging is tagging by a person so a machine can read it, not tagging by a machine. And that's where the linking comes in. When we, tag, when we machine tag it with a scientific name, that, that uh, image is then available to be harvested by another aggregator, worldwide aggregator called the Encyclopedia of Life. And uh, information and pictures of all species known to science gathered everywhere, ga gathered together and made available to everyone. The original tagline for that website was a web page for every species. So here's our tasseled anglerfish, now in an Encyclopedia of Life species page. Again, with links back to the Biodiversity Heritage Library and into Flickr. Going back to our Flickr album, if we also tag the, uh, tag the image uh, with a geolocation, in this case for Australia, it'll, get back in, it'll also be available for harvesting back into the, into the Atlas of Living Australia. And again, so here's our tasseled anglerfish now appearing, linked up and in the Atlas of Living Australia. Again, with its Flickr, uh, Flickr pointer and its Biodiversity Heritage Library pointer. So that makes so tagging things makes them discoverable and makes them able to be shared around between these different aggregators and much more findable. At this point, a quick aside about tagging, because as I've said, machine tags are tags applied by people, not tags applied by machines. Here's another example of a Flickr album, this one for a handwritten uh, diary uh, that we put up. When we put it up, we said, can you help tag the species in our field diaries? Which led to a long discussion uh, between some of the amazing volunteers that we have out in our community who are willing to do just this work. Um, led to a huge conversation about how best to do it, what should we do, let's get going, um, and huge acknowledgement to Siobhan and Michelle and some of the other taggers. Sh Siobhan might be here in the room, there she is. Um, uh, so huge hat tip and acknowledgement to the, vol the volunteers or the volunteers um, who do that work because without them we could never get um, this volume of work done and get these links made. Oftentimes it seems that within minutes of us putting up these Flickr albums, bang, they're tagged. And uh, it's just really amazes us every, every single time. So for the, all the promise of things happening automagically, we're certainly finding that the most outstanding, outstanding results actually come from people doing the work. So I did promise, as a last uh, little thing, to talk about meteorites. In the mid-1800s, a shower of meteorites fell in a line in an area of Australia sub subsequently called Cranbourne. And the biggest of these weighed in at 3,500 kilos. It's huge. It's an iron meteorite, so it's really, really heavy. And the photograph shows the meteorite roped up and ready to be pulled out of the ground. But if you've got an eagle eye, you'll see that's not our image. It's in our Museum of Victoria's collections online, but it's not our image. It's actually the image, um, an image from the State Library of Victoria. They very uh, generously and correctly tag this image as being in the public domain, which allows us to share it across. Now, we don't actually have a photograph of the whole meteorite because we don't have the whole meteorite in our collection any longer. So this was one, one way of being able to actually show uh, what um, the whole meteorite looked like when it was in the ground. There was a long drawn out battle about this meteorite and about a number, there was actually 12 meteorites in all that, were, that fell. And there was a long drawn out battle about who was, who was going to own these meteorites. The original one, that first one, uh, was actually sold. And it was sold to the British Museum um, who wanted to, who didn't think the, you know, the colonists could really be trusted with such an important scientific find. And so they wanted to take it back to the British Museum uh, where it could be properly looked after. And this plays out, so this whole argument plays out um, in these very heated letters to the editor of the Argus. It goes backwards and forwards. There were submissions to Parliament. There were submissions by the Royal Society of Victoria. And in the end, um, Frederick McCoy, our director, and a few others who were trying to promote the meteorite staying in Australia, lost the battle. And it was shipped back off to Britain. But we can see the whole story through looking, at the, looking through the archives. 
And so here's the Natural History Museum in uh, London, which um, now owns the meteorite. Um, and there's the record. You can see it in their data portal. But there's a little bit of a twist to this particular tale, a little ignominious twist. So the Natural History Museum are refurbishing their, their minerals galleries at the moment. Um, and as I said, this meteorite weighs three and a half thousand kilos. It's very, very heavy. So when they started to refurbish their galleries, they realised that they actually couldn't move the meteorite. Um, and so instead of moving it, they did what you do, they built a shop around it. And so here is our meteorite sitting in the Cranbourne Boutique of the Natural History Museum in London. And I think that poor old Mr McCoy would probably turn in his grave if he, if he knew that his meteorite that he fought so hard to keep in Australia um, was now uh, in a shop in London. Not for sale, of course, but in a shop. Um, so what we've done here is being able to tell a whole story, a whole tale, and there's so many other tales that we can tell in our collections. My very final comment is about a certain horse. <laughs> at, the, at the risk of being, you know, um, making myself very unpopular. Um, the obvious play... <laughs> So it's very obvious that uh, one, on one side of the ditch is the skeleton, on the other side of the ditch is the stuffed version with no skeleton in it. Um, and there's so many stories to tell about Farlap. It's interesting, for example, that in both our institutions, uh, Farlap is registered as a horse, which is a very sciencey sort of thing to do. Just go, oh yeah, it's just a horse, no biggie. Um, whereas to everybody else, to all the normal people out there, you go, but it's a racehorse, it's got all these stories to tell. And in fact, the story and the connection and the stories that people want to tell about these, this very famous horse, to which many people have an, a really amazing attachment to and really feel very personally connected to, um, they want to tell in their own scrapbook, their academic research paper or school project. But at the moment, you can't get from one collection online to see that the stuffed horse might be, might have uh, another part of it somewhere else in a different, uh, a different museum. So I think that's, that's possibly where we can start with linking between collections across, across and around the world is with a horse. Um, and that allows, but would, might allow people to find out the stories that they're really interested in. Um, and so let's start helping them out. Let's make some of the links so that the next person doesn't have to. Uh, and so that they can go on and forge the next step. Thank you.